the lights actually are really bright in here, so I can't actually see. I presume there are some people out there. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to introduce our um, lovely panellists, and then we're going to perform acrobatics on stage. <laughs> Never mind all that rubbish over there. Um, and this session is on Real Benefit Street. Uh, anybody who was here last year, there was a, uh, a conversation about Benefit Street. Did anybody watch Channel 4's Benefit Street? Why? <laughs> it was on telly. <laughs> okay, so we could we could have a debate about whether Jeremy Kyle or Benefit Street is a more accurate representation of the of the reality. What we're going to discuss is the is the real Benefit Street, the reality of life on benefits, um, and the subtitle I think if we had one was uh, the truth about sanctions, about benefit sanctions, um, and all three of our panelists um, know something about sanctions from a different perspective. Um, so we'll share, uh, in turn, some of the uh, reflections. Um, and at some point, I'm going to ask uh, uh, you lovely folk out there, if you have any reflections or experiences of sanctions or of benefits that you want to share, because I'm sure in an audience this size, there will be. The expertise is never just on this side. Uh, it, it's out there as well. Uh, we were... Um, uh, just sharing together uh, before this session. This might sound like a very serious session, um, and indeed it is. The issues we're going to be talking about are very serious. But actually, we were having a laugh because uh, some of what we will be talking about is so ridiculous um, that you have to have a sense of humour. Um, so do feel free to laugh uh, at the appropriate point. Um, so I'll just introduce the panel. Um, Paul Morrison works for the Methodist Church... Uh, doing public issues stuff. <laughs> I think I think that's his official job title. Um, and um, was the author of a report uh, earlier this year, or even last year? March. March. Uh, time to rethink benefit sanctions. Not to give away what Paul's going to talk about, really, or the line he takes. Um, on my my right. Uh, Angela Neville um, is here with various hats on. At one point, this is not the point to boo, uh, at one point worked for uh, DWP uh, Job Centre. Uh, and that's part of her journey. Um, she no longer works there um, and has also experience of being a benefit claimant herself. Uh, and out of her experiences wrote a play. Um, and we'll start with um, a little extract from from the play which is called Can This Be England? Can This Be England? And last and not least, uh, Damon Harper. Harper from Rotherham is here because he has personal experience of having been sanctioned and the reality of benefits at the harsh end. So we'll each share a bit and then we can get into discussion. So to start with, Angela, do you want to share... A little extract. It's not the full 45 minutes. No. <laughs> um, a little extract from Can This Be England? Thank you. Okay, so Can This Be England is a play that's written not just by myself, but by two other writers, um, Angela Howard and Jackie Bartlett. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, who are, incidentally, Quakers. I know we were just discussing that earlier. Um, so we all, sorry, we all wrote this play together, and this is a very short extract with the, from the character called Abby, who is a job centre advisor. I promise that I will do my best, do my duty to God, serve the Queen, help other people, and keep the Brownie Guide law. Over 40 years later, I still remember that vow, and that was why today... Even though I've heard it so many times before, today I really took offence at the message from our team meeting. Earn those brownie points. Reach the targets by any means necessary. Suspend benefits. Reduce benefits. Cancel benefits. My mum said, 
But you can't just invent things to catch people out. And when I didn't say anything, she understood. I asked her if she remembered the brownie badges I used to work for. Those little embroidered patches. Cookery, hostess, the writer and the reader ones. Badges of honour. But now I can almost imagine looking down at my sleeve and seeing a row of new ones. Causing distress, financial and mental. Manipulating statistics. Creative caseload reduction. I don't think my mum would be happy about sewing those on for me. And I keep thinking about my colleague Nina. The day she said, if I kill myself, do you think it would change anything? Will the managers realise what it is we're really doing to people? Now, I've had some really demanding jobs over the years, but I never heard my colleagues talking openly about suicide as a means of protest. Um, so, Angela, what, what was it really like to work in a job centre? Well, it was very interesting because it changed quite dramatically. When I first started in 2009, you actually had resources to help people, support people back into work. Um, I worked mostly with customers on the health-related benefits. And you actually had the things there to get people, you know, to really support them. I don't mean force them into work, but I do mean people who had been left uh, on benefits, just left abandoned, essentially, never contacted, no support from any agency. And you to see somebody who had maybe been on benefits for, you know, more than 10 years, who perhaps was able to go out into the workplace just for a few hours a week, voluntary work, to see that change in them, that was so rewarding. So that was really great. Then from about 2010, strangely enough, it began to change. The resources were taken away and the target-driven sort of system began to come into force. And the team meetings, just as in the play, you would have colleagues leaving in tears because we were constantly told to see every single interview as an opportunity to begin the... Um, the, the sanctions aren't always used as the first point to say to, about people, but also to sort of start that process. So it was regardless of whether somebody was entitled to something, their eligibility, um, that you were expected to begin that process of um, essentially sort of penalising them and punishing them to reduce the, the numbers on various benefits, essentially. And how did that make you feel? Well... I, seriously, this sounds extremely sort of um, precious perhaps, but I actually felt, I can't help but use the word morally compromised. Um, you know, if one does have a faith, but that's regardless of that anyway. The I was brought up to believe that you support vulnerable people. You don't persecute them. You do not go out of your way to actually think of, that person there looks like they won't understand this system. They will get confused by these forms. They will get confused by the things that are being asked to do. So, great, we'll have a result there. You know, that's not how I was brought up and that's not something I was comfortable with and was getting increasingly unhappy about. And was that something your, all your colleagues felt? Or? I would say the majority felt it, but um, unlike them, I have worked in a lot of industries. I've worked for a lot of big organisations, the NHS, for example, the BBC, local government, education. So I've had a very broad experience of what you um, expect your expected as an employee and what you're expected to do as your duties. A lot of my colleagues have all, had always worked within the benefit system or for the social security system. And almost a bit like customers... Some of the customers who were, as I say, left abandoned on benefits for many years, some of my colleagues could see no other life outside of that um, office. They, they simply couldn't imagine it. They were terrified of the world of work and the world outside of, of the job centre or the benefit office, whatever you want to say. Um, and so I think whatever their feelings were about the changes, a lot of them just were, I wouldn't say happy to go along with it, but just just felt compelled to go along with it and could not um, fight against it. Um, what were some of the, the kind of techniques you were encouraged to use? Or well, I mean, it was very... I mean, the, the, the greatest example I can give to you, which was the day that I felt the turning point happened to me. I mean, you know they often say, you, is there a day that something happened or a moment? For me, it was when a customer called me um, who had a serious um, life-threatening illness. He was about to go into hospital for surgery... 
Uh, we had a lovely conversation. It wasn't a miserable conversation, but the man wasn't expected to live beyond the surgery. So we had a you know, perfectly lovely conversation. Uh, we both parted on very good terms. Um, obviously, it was quite upsetting, and I, I really was hoping it'd be all right. The next day, the work program list came around, and we were told to contact customers and bring them in. They had to be called in immediately. He was one of them. So logically, I said, you know, sorry, it's okay. I've already spoken to him. This is the situation. It's all on the system. Oh, no, no, no. He has to come in or else he will be, you know, face he hasn't attended. He will then begin the sanctions process. That's when I just thought, this, you know, this isn't just, you know, persecution. This is illogical. This is completely illogical. I refused to call him, and a sensible manager actually agreed and said, no, you know, he can be excused. There are ways of, of you know, exempting customers in, in these situations. Um, you know, particularly if he was going to be dead, that would be a bit tricky, you know, um, obviously. Uh, he would be off the list, that would be a good thing, but uh, no, not so good. But, uh, you know, so that was when the, the, this thing changed. And genuinely, one of my colleagues was so distressed by this whole episode and by the, the, the things that we were being asked to do from these lists, uh, she did actually say, as I, we put into the play, if she killed herself, would the managers actually take action? And I was shocked by that because I, you know, no job is worth that, no job is worth that. Um, we managed to get her off that particular job and, and onto something less stressful, slightly less stressful. But that was the day that I just thought, no, nah, this, is, this is bad and I don't think it's going to get better. So um, a little later, you, the tables were turned. Yes, they were. Um, I, um, well, into, they, they were turned twice in my case. You know, I went from one side of the desk to the other side and back again and whatever. Um, I was actually made redundant from the job centre because of work-related stress. And when I went in to uh, make a claim, because I was, you know, I was entitled, I was, it, it was explained that due to the way my job had ended, a doubt may have arisen on my claim. And this is the job centre that I worked in with colleagues that I'd worked with for five years who were telling me this. So that was, that was surreal there. Um, then, unfortunately, earlier this year, I had um, an accident... And as accidents, we know that's the name of them. They're an accident. You don't plan them. Um, and then followed on with some surgery. I injured my knee quite severely and had to claim ESA. And um, again, Do you want to spell, been, out, spell out what it is? That's Employment and Support Allowance. And that's for customers or claimants, pardon me, who we refer to them as customers, who um, are unable to work or seek work for, you know, whatever period it is due to a health or an accident or a health condition or an illness. So there's lots of different reasons. Um, and as on this particular benefit, you attend a work um, capability assessment interview, which is to see if you can do some work, not necessarily the work you could do before, but something, which, you know, is, it, it, essentially it sounds positive, doesn't it? It could be a good thing. Um, but unfortunately for me, that was the week before I had surgery. So when the report came out, it was completely irrelevant, completely irrelevant. So I had to go through a very complicated um, appeals and reconsideration process. And, you know, it's very stressful. Fortunately, I kind of knew some of the system, but even so, it was still incredibly complicated. And I know that it's designed to be like that, to put people off actually trying to have reconsiderations or appeals. Um, it isn't, you know, the happiest situation to be in. I rather wish I hadn't had to experience that firsthand. But I've seen some very good um, advisors. I've had some very good advice. And I've also had some extremely um, unhelpful advice. And I think if someone had been in a very vulnerable mental state, because an injury does leave you quite vulnerable as well, um, you know, it's difficult to see how they may have come through it quite so easily as I had. So, yeah, I, it's, it's been interesting. I could have done without that, that extra bit of experience, quite frankly, but uh, there you go. That's the way the world is. <laughs> okay. So, um, on to Damon. Um, do you want to just kind of introduce people to yourself and your, how, how you've ended up experiencing yeah. benefits? Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, Damon, 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 Damon Harper. It's the first time for me here. <laughs> First time for me anywhere, in fact. Yeah, um, when I got sanctioned, uh, which was two months ago, I lost my benefit for four weeks. During that time, I found out that the first two weeks, you've got to stand yourself. 
until the two weeks after you get the um oh what's it called hardship yeah yeah uh 78 pounds and that's got last year fortnight um but when i first heard about the sanctions i actually gave up work to follow other people because i thought right okay they're doing a big mistake here which they have already they've made too many mistakes now in the government and uh Basically, I class them now as murderers. They're nothing more, they're just scum, as far as I'm concerned. And, uh, yeah, and, uh, you see, the thing is, what, what happens when you're sanctioned? If you're sanctioned for a month to three years now, uh, there's nothing gets paid. No rent gets paid, no contact. So you're left homeless, basically. And uh, it's really ridiculous. It should never happen. So uh, I'm now fighting for a new government uh, and let's hope we can all get supported around that with different schemes now. I mean, I've, I've learnt a lot in the last uh, three weeks. I've been down to Windermere to join a group called the Windermere Warri 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 Warriors, <coughs> which is quite interesting. You find out a lot of things from different people. Uh, universal credit, that doesn't work either. That's another thing that's being brought in. And that's not worked. And uh, I just hope that some things can be overturned for the sake of us all, because it's going to get a lot worse. If we stick with this government any longer, things are going to get a lot worse. So, so so Damon, do you want to say a bit more about the, partic the particular circumstances of why you were sanctioned and... And how much money you had in your pocket when you were sanctioned? Yes, I can. Uh, apparently, the reason why I was sanctioned is because I didn't do enough on my work search. Um, what it was, I'd been, I'd been looking at different jobs. I mean, I've worked 21 years in horses, and uh, I've done various jobs, and, and not one of them suited me. And, uh, and I thought, well, and they wanted me to apply for jobs. So I says, okay, then. I'll take, I'll take all the jobs off the website, I'll apply for 5,000 jobs all at once, right, and they can have the paperwork. Oh, we don't want that. <laughs> well, if I were to apply for every single job, that's what you'd get. You'd get all the paperwork. And uh, so at the end of the day, they just said, oh, just write it down. And I thought, okay, no problem. So that's what I did. And... Uh, but, but because I could only put a few jobs on my, on me, on my uh, farm that I was supposed to fill in every, every fortnight, and uh, they told me I weren't I I doing enough. And when they sanctioned me, I'd actually got £1.17 in my bank account. <laughs> so it went a lot to live on. Uh, believe me, it don't stretch. Not, not at all. And I wasn't going to a food bank because I find that food banks should never exist. You know, we, we shouldn't be living like this. It's it, it's just simple truth. We should not be living like this. And uh, and uh, yeah, it's, we we just shouldn't be living like this. So, so so how did you get through those two weeks when you had no money, or you had one pound seventeen? Well, I like living from hand to mouth. I mean, where I live, I live in a complex. So it went too bad. I mean, I was borrowing a little bit of money, but not a lot. I couldn't borrow a great deal because I knew I'd got to pay it back. So, uh, and we know where we're going to go to uh, any long people to say, oh, you know, can I borrow this much? You know, and this interest rates are sky high anyway. Yeah. You know, and uh, you can't do it. So how did it make you feel? Shocked, to say the least. Really shocked. You know, and I... And, I just felt sorry for other people, you know, because I thought, well, I'm not the only one in this, you know, and a lot of people have died because of this, you know, and, and I thought, well, come on, you've got to do something. So I did, I started writing to me MP, um, I got feedback which were positive, but then I have to write again to make sure that things are carrying on. So what would you say the truth about welfare is then? When, when, you, when you read the headlines and watch the telly, what, what do you think your message about welfare is? There's nothing on the TV to cover that at all. Everything you see about the government is on social media. 
And the social media are also going to be owned by the government eventually, because they, they're going to strip it all. Um, but from, what I've heard, from what I've seen on the social media sites, sometimes, yeah, it can be put up. But sometimes, like, some people do tell the truth. And, uh, but, um, but, yeah, I mean, uh, Ian, Ian Duncan Smith the other day, he, was, um, he made a statement in the, in the Guardian and said, um, no, it wasn't Ian Duncan Smith. I tell a lie, it was George Osborne and, uh, and uh, David Cameron. And they made a statement from The Guardian stating like that, that, that they'd spent 1.5 billion pounds, you know. And I thought, no, we haven't. <laughs> you know, this country's supposed to be in debt, but that debt in, isn't ours. That debt is somebody else's. Nothing to do with us. Forget the deficit, that's not ours, that's someone else's mistake. And we're having to pay for it. £12 billion in benefit cuts. No, that's not fair. OK, thanks, Dan. We'll, we'll come back come on back in a bit. Uh, Paul, um, you've, um, you're, it's fair to say, a bit of a geek. Is that OK? You I can revel in the term geek. <laughs> Um, so you've delved, delved into the depths of the statistics of the Department for Work and Pensions. Yes, I have. I am that man. Uh, and what did you find? One of the things that shocked us, I think, when we did this research, we, we started looking at benefit sanctions largely because it's a big reason why people turn up in, at food banks. That's how we started hearing about benefit sanctions. And what shocked us is the sheer scale and the sheer change in scale that happened between 2009 and 2013. To give you an idea, uh, last year, the last year we've got full numbers for, 1.2 million sanctions were given out. 1.2 million people went through the experience we've just heard about. That's extraordinary, utterly extraordinary. Previous to that, and during the 2000s, about 200,000 sanctions were being given out. But one of the key things that happened was the Welfare Reform Bill of 2012 changed the duration of sanctions as well. Prior to, prior to 2012, the average length of time people went without money was about nine days. After 2012, the minimum length of time that people on Job Seekers Alliance went without money was a month. And that then escalates to three months and then escalates again, uh, depending on what level of sanction you do. It can go up to three years without any money at all. And then one of the things that got us, that utterly astounded us, is the rules around hardship payments. And that's something that you, you talked about, that people who have got nothing for whatever reason can apply for a hardship payment. Now, and I'll prove my geekdom here, rule uh, paragraph 30,099 of the Decision Maker's Guide. Go check it for yourselves. It, it is there. And the worrying thing is I read all the other paragraphs too. <laughs> In that, it states that we can't give a hardship payment to someone immediately because we need the person to understand they are being punished. So in order, to, in order to maintain the deterrent effect of the sanction, is the phrase, we must leave people without money for a fortnight. So this hardship system is that you turn up, you say, I have nothing, and you have to prove you have nothing to, become, to qualify for a hardship payment. And at that point, they say, yes, we know, you can't afford to eat and you can't afford to heat your house. You must now wait two weeks for money in order to maintain the deterrent effect of the sanction. And then it gives, it gives a get-out clause and says that unless you're in a vulnerable group. And then the definition of a vulnerable group is fantastic. It's truly amazing. First of all, if your illness, that if you have an illness that is a mental illness, you're not vulnerable. Only those with physical illnesses, only physical illnesses count towards vulnerability. The second thing, 
which is fairly extraordinary. It says that anyone who goes through those two weeks without any money and without the ability to look after themselves, without the ability to buy the basics, their health is likely to deteriorate. Therefore, our criteria for vulnerability is not your health will deteriorate if we don't give you this payment. Our criteria is your health has to deteriorate faster than an average person. So in, those, in that paragraph, there is an admission that in order to maintain the deterrent effect of a sanction, in order to encourage people to fill in the book that he was talking about, because the majority of sanctions are given on for not filling in enough of that book. In order to encourage people to fill in that book, we are happy to use as a threat two weeks of hunger such that it is likely to cause your health to deteriorate. There's this ironic situation that if you burn down a job center, the criminal justice system is not allowed to make your health deteriorate through not giving you money. However, if you're lit to burn down the job center, <laughs> then they're allowed to make your health deteriorate. So what are you saying here, Paul? I'm not fond of sanctions. I'm not afraid to say that. So what I'm saying is that the sanction system is huge. The government, I, and you can tell how geekish I am, the Office for National Statistics has just told the government off about how it presents the numbers on sanctions because it consistently underestimates them. Every time there's an appeal, it overwrites the old sanctions so you don't count the number of sanctions that were actually given out. And they've, and you may have heard us, uh, a number of 5% of people are sanctioned. The actual number is around about 24%. And the Office of National Statistics has finally told the department off for giving out such rubbish numbers. This is a system that is absolutely, it is the very heart and soul of the benefit system that operates today. And you would expect the heart and soul to be providing a basic minimum for people who've fallen on hard times. The heart and soul of the system is punishing people if they don't obey the rules to the absolute letter, to the absolute nth degree. OK. Um, as I said, there's a, there's a kind of a dark humor about this. Um, Actually, um, even if you try and uh, obey the, the rules to the letter, uh, it doesn't always work. Um, there's, a, there's a website which actually collects uh, bizarre sanction stories. Uh, my favourite is from Teesside, uh, where somebody went to sign on, as they have to, on the appointed hour. They were in the lift inside the job centre. The lift broke down. Uh, they were late for their signing on and they were sanctioned. Uh, so I want the panel to um, share any other of uh, you know your most bizarre story about how lovely our benefit system works. My my one I came across recently. It was about a woman with a we a young child went to sign on, but the child wanted to go to Lou, so she went to Lou, and the next thing she knew, she got sanctioned for it. So you know it don't make sense, does it? Well, I think I sort of gave you my funny story about the, the man who was probably dying who would have been sanctioned if he didn't turn up for the interview. Um, but he did survive, I'm glad to say. Um, I just want to add, it's not so much a funny story, but it is just to reiterate and to, to, to carry on what, what Paul said as well there, that this sanctions, there may be some of you here, and, and please don't be embarrassed if you are here, that sanctions are a valid piece of the, the system. They are there to remind some people who may have forgotten genuinely, who may be confused, genuinely confused. But the fact that I'm just saying is they're not used for the right way. It's being corrupted. They're not used for the right reasons for being eligible or entitlement, okay? So, um, sorry, it's not much of a funny story because I was, you know, as I say, on that side of the desk at that point. But, um, yeah, all the other stories as well. I've heard of people who've had, yeah, you know, heart attacks. The one in the heart attack, the gentleman had a heart attack, that's correct, in the middle of his um, work capability assessment interview had a heart attack, obviously the interview had to be called short so the ambulance could be called. And, yeah, he was sanctioned because he didn't finish the interview. And, um, yeah, I think we, we, were, we all said, you know, crikey, I mean, you know, if that was an act, that man, you know, acting and Hollywood beckons, I'm sure, if that was 
not uh, genuine. Paul? I'll give you a funny story that involves a graph. <laughs> and it's kind of dry humour. You mightn't laugh out loud, but, you know, we'll, we'll go with it. The sanction system was introduced in 1997 and all this pressure on people, the pressure that is put on people who are looking for work, sort of the threat of punishment was introduced essentially then. The rate at which people come off benefits, the rate at which people get work, hasn't changed. So we have introduced a system in which you punish people and all the evidence says that introducing the system that punishes people doesn't get people into work any faster. But we've got a massive bureaucracy to do this. I'm trying to come to a punchline, but I haven't quite got there yet. <laughs> but what I'm saying, I just find it funny that it is our... <laughs> He's just opened a sanction letter. <laughs> But I think it's really instructive about the society we live in that even though, I'm moving on, that even though we know that it has no effect, and in fact, until 1989, you didn't even have to actively seek work when you were unemployed. You merely had to accept a job if it was offered to you. We know that even though you put all this pressure on people, it has no effect and yet we still want to do it because it makes us feel better. And that, I think that should make us think about ourselves a bit, that it makes us feel better to put this pressure on people. Sorry, not funny. OK. Uh, I, think, I think Paul's life as a uh, stand-up comedian is probably... Um, stick to the graphs. Uh, if you're not depressed enough about uh, the welfare system... Uh, we produced a report um, also um, earlier this year um, outlining another eight holes in the, the welfare safety net, which uh, I'm not going to go into chapter and verse about, uh, but they're here in the report. Uh, just one of them, um, people that have been assessed from uh, ESA or its pre uh, predecessor incapacity benefit as being fit for work. There's a million and a half people that have been assessed as fit for work the Department for Work and Pensions has no idea where any of those people are. Uh, some, hopefully, have got work. Some may be on Job Seekers Allowance. Uh, some may be uh, anywhere or anywhere, uh, destitute or whatever. But uh, the, the Department for Work and Pensions computer system, which um, Paul loves, uh, cannot tell you where any of those people have gone to, um, which is slightly terrifying. One and a half million people. Particularly when you know how many of the assessments are wrong. And Paul will probably give us chapter and verse on which regulation that is. No, I'm just... One of the things that has to be remembered about the benefit system is their measure... Every job centre has one target, and it's called off-flow. So its target is to get people off benefits, which sounds good, but it's not get people off benefits onto into work, because they don't measure that. It's to get people off benefits full stop. So around about 45% of the people eligible for Job Seekers Alliance actually claim it. The other ones are an off flow and they've gone away and they aren't our problem anymore. The one program in which they measure whether or not people get a job is called the Work Program, which Duncan Smith uh, announced as the most successful back to work program in history. I, I couldn't possibly comment. But what I can tell you is that there are around about two times as many sanctions given out to people on the work program as there were jobs given out to people on the work program. So my view would be that we should rename it the sanctions program. <laughs>